the thing, I've, I've thought about this because I actually, it's a, a little over a year ago, I got the norovirus while I was at work. Another one of our docs had had it a couple days earlier, and I thought, this guy doesn't wash his hands enough, you know, and I'm good about doing this. Got it while I was there, and we, you know, we were seeing like hundreds of patients with the norovirus and sick for a little while, and I got over it, and I thought, you know, the patient checks into the ER, and then they go in and touch everything in the room, and their clothes and the doorknob and all that kind of stuff. I wash my hands, I go in, I touch them and examine them, then I wash my hands, then I go touch all the same stuff that they touched on the way out. I Is mean, there a how, chaperone in there? Yeah, there <laughs> might be an extra one. But so do we have to like wear a space suit? Are we like a containment lab where you should have a, a hood, you know, the fume hood and all that kind of stuff? I mean, to what extent do you actually take that kind of thing? The, uh, I remember when I first started out, and we, we used to have to wash our hands to put on sterile gloves to prep patients for the OR, you know, for like a drainage of an abscess. And I thought this is, now this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, you know, but so I, I'd like to know what is actually a, a good practice. I always do it after I touch the patient in their presence so that they can see that I'm doing it. I think this idea of washing your hands in the hallway and that kind of stuff, you don't get any bang for your buck there because they haven't seen you do it. But I don't know how often you have to do it to, to do things. And I don't know that all of it is transmitted by hands anyway. You know, they're, they're coughing in the room, and you're going to go wash your hands. doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, for what, me, what's a little soap and water? Wash the hands of mine and the next patient. I don't want to do it 70 times. Well, here's a, uh, here's a survey. Clean, well, first of all, clean. you realize that the, the, uh, the uh, gels don't kill C. difficile. So if C. difficile is one of these hospital-acquired infections, you must use soap to get C. difficile. The, the alcohol-based stuff doesn't get it. So I don't know what infections are actually talking about. A hospital-acquired infection is a urinary tract infection. Well, it actually doesn't matter whether you wash your hands or not. It's usually the patient's own germs that give them that. It's, you know, E. coli, and it's not the staph on your skin. So I'll I don't tell know you, I think it's going to turn out that the only safe place that you can touch is the toilet seat. <laughs> which is still, it's, a, it's the cleanest place in the bathroom. Uh, uh, the survey number two sort of carries this hang, on. Hang on, though. I've got to back up on this. How many have heard Rick's now famous? <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. The now famous, do I have to wash my hands after I pee and go to the bathroom? Which is more clean, one or the other? Rick, would you like to give us a no, rendition of that? Or now no. that we're on tape... We can't do this anymore. No, I just have some, you know, view of, uh, you know, it's a, you watch the other guys go to the john, you know, and they ritually wash their hands on the way out. Why are you washing your hands after you touch your penis? You know, you should wash your hands before you touch your penis because my penis is cleaner than my hands, honest to goodness. <laughs> so it's kind of bass accurate, don't you think? I think the joke is that one guy tells the other, uh, you should wash your hands after you pee. And then the second guy says, well, actually, you shouldn't pee on your hands. Uh, and then they just leave it at that. Uh, number two is a survey that asks people uh, when they're exposed to people with respiratory infections, what sort of precautions do they take? Uh, so one of the conclusions is, is that we don't typically put on hazmat suits when we go in to see a kid with an upper respiratory infection. But I will tell you, one of the findings in here, which I find utterly shocking, Now I want you to think, there's a child in that room. That child has a runny nose, a sore throat, and a cough. You're about to go in that room, mm -hmm. and 10 to 25% of you do not use eye protection, according to this survey. Is this what we're supposed to be doing? I only, I've only worked in my entire career with one person, it was a PA, uh, that she, if she, I saw her once cleaning abrasions on a face, and she was in a space suit. She had the hair thing, she had the, the goggles, the mask, everything. She'd scared this poor child to death with this thing. But she was, she was doing facial abrasions. She was, looked like she was ready to scrub in for a triple A. And, uh, but she would just routinely scare people. People thought they were dying because she'd come into the room all dressed up like this. But this is... But when you actually, when you think about it, it is sort of funny that uh, most of us in this room probably walk right into the room uh, of, uh, of, of, of a kid that's coughing right in your face. In fact, you'll pick them up and hold them or play with I, I do. And uh, um, how many of you wear a mask when you go in to see somebody with a cold? How many of you don't wear a mask? How many of you can't raise your hands because of herpes? Okay. So 
only four people in the back. Uh, so this list, a study lists all of these things that theoretically could be done to prevent the transmission of a respiratory virus, getting ready for the SARS uh, thing that we're going to have. And they said, look at all of these things that you don't do. And just like the first paper, show me, in fact, that it matters. Show me th that it makes a difference before you list all of these things uh, and I have to do them before I, I can show you that it doesn't matter. Well, you know, there's actually two things. One, one has been banned in Britain. I like this. Uh, no ties in the hospital because they're just a repository for infectious disease. There was has, a has that ever been shown? There was a, a, well, it's just shown that ties are dirty, that they're dirtier than toilet seats. That's, that's sort of the measure of everything. Uh, and uh, also coat, uh, lab coats are, uh, are teeming with all sorts of evil things. I mean, think about how most of us in this room that wear lab coats in the emergency department, boy, we wash them, what, once a year? Uh, whether they need it or not. Uh, Stethoscopes? Uh, you're, I'm keeping mine colonized with benign bacteria. You know, it's, <laughs> all right, number three. We're out, we're out of that. This is a, a, a sort of an interesting paper, that's to be kind. Um, the main point to it being that not all elevations of troponin mean that it's your heart. So that's a good take home message. Other things can make your troponin go up. Uh, however, now, when you look at the study here, you got to wonder, what were their gold standards for doing this kind of stuff? They, they said uh, an abnormal was above 0.03, and it was elevated in 42% of the patients. Some incredible number of people just sort of randomly selected. The mean highest was in the acute MI. Uh, sensitivity was 94%, but it was also elevated in myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and it was elevated in renal failure, it was elevated in pulmonary embolism, it was elevated in people with unstable angina. So let me think, they have ongoing chest pain and they have an abnormal troponin and you've said it's not a heart attack. How, how did you do that? I don't understand how they get to that kind of stuff or what they had as the gold standard for other things. So be that as it may, uh, you know, some people have these elevations and they're not heart attacks. I agree with that. But then you have to tell me sort of the gold standard as to why you thought it wasn't for some of these things. Although last year we did a paper, we did a 30 minutes on what things will elevate your BNP and what things will elevate your troponin. And the thrust of that 30 minutes is that there was a lot of things can elevate your troponins that, are, that are not even related to your heart. That I, We don't know why, but I, they, they go up. And BNPs are uh, in that neighborhood too. I, I'm still not sure that this is so. I think what is clear is that troponins can be elevated for reasons other than acute occlusion of a vessel, uh, like myocarditis and whatever else. But uh, uh, acute renal failure, uh, one of the reasons, uh, why do people die with acute renal failure? Because it's acute multi-system organ failure is what they're really dying of, of which the most obvious manifestation is renal. So it's not surprising that you might get a bump in your troponin. Oddly enough, the papers that argue that some of these troponins and renal failure are not important or they're not related to the, uh, to the heart, what they'll say in the article is, we find that a lot of people uh, with renal failure have these little elevations of troponin that we don't think are clinically significant, although their mortality rate over the next year is twice as high as the ones that don't have elevated troponins. Now, this to me is a bizarre thing, but I, I still, as far as I know, the only place troponin I comes from is the heart. So there may be a number of things that cause the heart to release it other than a, a coronary occlusion. But I still have not seen anything that conclusively shows that this stuff is coming from somewhere other than the heart. Well, uh, take people who run a marathon, within an hour, they will have abnormal elevation of cardiac troponin I, and then it's down by the end of a couple hours, and then six hours after the race, it's up again. Probably not heart related, but who knows. The other thing was here, they said some of the patients with MIs still had the troponin within the normal range. And I thought, you know, I thought we've now actually switched to using troponin as the gold standard for MI. You know, we actually did that without anybody noticing. You know that? It was never really, never really a study to prove that. We just kind of declared it that way. And, and we have actually changed our standards for MI based on that. All right, number four, independent evaluation of an out-of-hospital termination of resuscitation clinical decision rule. Um, academic Emergency Medicine, June of 08. 
basically they, they commented that in the past we know that a lot of cardiac arrests were just providing futile care to. And was, is there a decision rule that we can actually apply so we can not even start resuscitation attempts or we can just dis discontinue them without having a real problem? And what they looked at was the Save Hearts and Arizona Registry share. And they said those patients without return of spontaneous circulation prior to transport mm -hmm. for whom shocks have not been administered and with the rest not witnessed by EMS personnel are not going to have any benefit. It's interesting, 0.09% or one patient out of 1,160 actually had a good neurologic outcome and survival. So this comes down to a medical economist view. Is all the money spent on those patients who don't survive worth those 0.09% who do? And I think it's easy to say, oh, sitting in this room, eh, we probably don't need to be doing that. And that makes sense with the current state of health care. But it's interesting, at least in the U.S. anyway, we have a um, kind of a, a survive and, and rescue mentality. When we want to ration health care, it's fine as long as we're not rationing our own health care. When we need something, then we want it provided to us, and we want to rescue those people. We do need to change that culture. Um, but it's interesting, this article really suggests that we should just put a protocol like this in place, and the overwhelming majority will save health care dollars on, but occasionally we're going to miss somebody we could have saved. Well, you'll save more than healthcare dollars. I actually took a look at this many years ago. One of our paramedics was running lights and sirens on a traumatic cardiac arrest in the field and got in a bad accident and got badly injured. Long-term disability, long time coming back, and I saw him for one complication he had one time in the air. This is a guy that I helped train and do some other things. And he just looked at me and he said, Dr. Little, why are we even running lights and sirens on these folks? Because you've always taught us if they have a traumatic cardiac arrest in the field, nobody survives from that. I said, you know what? You're right. So within a year, we changed the protocol in our county. If, you know, your head is in one street and the rest of your body is in another, we declare you field dead and we don't run lights and sirens on that kind of stuff. So we have field, we, it, more, for more things than that as well. But uh, field declaration of death is something that we do uh, now routinely. Uh, and this is, this is, you know, registry data is only so good, but I, I think this is a, a reasonable thing to do. I think the new papers are going to be, should we spend the money to save this one guy or should we give them to the Wall Street people? <laughs> uh, have you, any of you uh, been involved with the development of a protocol that would allow the paramedics to declare people uh, dead in the field who had recently been involved with CPR kind of thing? So nobody out there has done it. Uh, so everybody's to, to bring them to hospital, lights and sirens on. No, you're not? You're not? How many are involved in medical, online medical control? So do you tell them to stop uh, resuscitations in the field? Yeah. Yeah. In Los Angeles, they uh, had a bunch of people come together and to kind of come up with some guidelines to do this because of the lights and sirens and the risks associated with it. It wasn't one of these things. It was just uh, neutral. This. This is the first paper that I saw that kind of really put a number on it in terms of the return on investment that you would get. Number five is a public health impact of full impl implementation of that therapeutic hypothermia stuff where you take these people who have had CPR, they are now have a blood pressure and a pulse, but they are still unconscious. And um, they point out that the American Heart Association and the uh, International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, that ILCOR group, said this is a good thing to do. They point out a study in 2006 said at, at academic centers of all places that 74% of the doctors said they had never used hypothermia for such patients. And um, these folks at the University of Michigan, using some assumptions about how many arrests there were and how many were going to be uh, in this state and what kind of return on it, uh, they would get, the number they needed to treat is uh, six that's from a couple of studies. They concluded that had we broadly embraced this, we would save somewhere between like 2,300 people is, uh, is the assumption, but the range could go from as little as 300 people in the United States a year to 9,500 people a year if we use this therapy. Uh, and they're trying to point out the disconnect between the literature that exists, the recommendations of these organizations, the fact that doctors don't do this and what, it is, what the cost is in terms of neurologically intact survival. So I'm going to ask you, any of you uh, cooling down your patients? My, my, my point is, what about the disconnect between doing it and what you can do when you've got a group of cardiacs? And how do you do that? Well, you, you have to admit, though, when the, somebody comes in in a cardiac arrest with a heartbeat and a, pul uh, and a blood pressure, 
that those people will uh, occupy your time. You're not going to say, well, I got, you know, I got these other cases I got to see here. I mean, you're required to do something on those. It's not like we can walk away and do a 30-second cardiac arrest on those cases. They've already declared themselves as you're, you're going to be your patient for a while. So uh, there's a lot of hands went up. Uh, normally, we don't see that many hands. Is, are this mainly, mostly the Australians and Canadians, where they just open the ambulance and freeze the patients? You know, <laughs> something like that there. So I will tell you, there was an article in the New York Times about a month ago, and it featured a, uh, a neurologist at North Shore Hospital who was in cardiac arrest, came in, met all these criteria, and now is back practicing neurology. Uh, an EMS, a 911 uh, EMS system in New York decided that they would not bring uh, uh, patients to hospitals that, that could not d do cooling. So all of a sudden, there was, uh, not from physicians, but from the hospital administrators, a sudden flood of, of interest in, in therapeutic cooling. So now 100% of the emergency departments in New York, of course, now do therapeutic uh, cooling. So, so let's, let's go back. There are only two controlled studies on this. One done in Australia, and the outcome parameter that was better was discharge to a nursing home or discharge not to a nursing home. That was the outcome parameter, not a neurologic exam, just ability to go to a nursing home or not. And ability to go to a nursing home is more multifunctional in terms of family members and all that kind of stuff, and, and it was small. They said they tried to control for that, and it wasn't blinded, all that kind of stuff. So that's one outcome parameter. The other one was the multi-center European trial that did this, and uh, they said the patients that got hypothermia did better, and they did, whether they got hypothermic or not because an awful lot of them, they couldn't get them cool. Why? <laughs> because they're waking up. So, so that's the science behind it. Everything else is we did it, we liked it, uh, we gave them a whole bunch of saline and their temperature came down, uh, we cooled them this way and their temperature came down, but nothing more than that, and everybody hearkens to the science in, well, in other neurologic things, it's been used so much. Well, in other neurologic things, it's been used so much, but it's never worked for anything after the fact. Yeah, you can take somebody, you can put them on pump, take their temperature down to freezing, turn off the pump, go out to lunch, come home, turn on the pump and their brain's normal when you wake them up. No question about that. We've done it for head injury. We just did it recently for head injury in children and their outcome was worse than it was that those who didn't get cooled. So I, I think we need to be careful on this. This is a bandwagon that is coming based on, you know, both of those studies that I mentioned to you, their conclusion was, this needs better study, where we should look at this. I, you know, anytime you have a multi-center anybody trial, where everybody contributes one or two people, I always have my suspicions that that's, you know, that raises an interesting issue. We ought to do a really good study on this before we, I don't mind if people want to do it, but I think we shouldn't believe that we should be implementing systems and bypassing hospitals and devoting all of our stuff to it. I, I, think I, need, I think we need actually more studies. And now, once people start doing this, we will never again know if this really works or not. That's the trouble. Although the issue up until now is nobody was doing it with the uh, little evidence that was there. And it's like, well, this person well, is- Well, there's no more evidence. <laughs> there, this person is alive. So are you potentially going to benefit them? Or are you potentially going to harm them by this uh, uh, therapy. So the answer in the past has been, there's been this disconnect. It, it, what, the doctors weren't doing it because they questioned the science. The doctors weren't doing it for, you know, what appears to be not good reasons. They were, you know, they didn't have a machine to do it. There was ice. How are we going to get them cool? That kind of thing. It was a mechanical uh, event rather than, well, I've really studied the literature and I don't think this really works. Well, despite the, the comments Neil makes, which are very valid, I mean, I think this is a reasonable thing to consider. When you look at who we're supposed to apply this to. If you're applying it to all cardiac arrest patients, you're not doing it right. I mean, these are patients who had a primary rhythm of V-fib that had a spontaneous return of circulation, and they didn't wake up. And that's, these are the people it's applied to. So how many of those do you get a day or a month or a year? It's a small percentage of people. Ice is cheap, last time I checked, especially here. We can get a lot of it, a lot of ice. And I was approached for our group by a couple different companies out there that want to sell us this, this vest and to cool people down and I finally said, listen, I mean, I can, I can pack them in ice and do the same thing you can do, maybe not quite as quick. They told me, we can get it done in three and a half minutes. Well, I said, the, the literature doesn't say it has to be that fast. 
So $5,000 for the suit and then the replacement pieces, I think, for every use was, I don't know, $2,500 or something, very pricey. So I'll tell you what, why don't you give us the initial setup and as we use them, then we'll purchase a replacement. And that was the end of the conversation, one they didn't of, want to do it. One of the biggest uh, exhibits I've ever seen in my life at an ASAP meeting was one of these cooling, uh, cooling things. They had a University of Alabama cheerleader and a halter top that they were laying on this thing and they were cooling her. Uh, to demonstrate the thing, you would you would not believe how big a crowd there was around it. It was just it was absolutely absurd. You, you had a comment over there. Well, first, uh, Richard, how many materials do you buy? Okay, so that, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, the basic science seems like it goes back to the ceiling, and there's multiple you know kind of animal models that are supporting it. So the, to your initial thought is that hey, we just don't have enough information to deny it, yeah. but and that, it's not really showing harm, right? It, it is sort of mobilizing. Well, it's, it's I actually, vis-a-vis -vis Kevin's comment, we actually looked at this at our at our institution. We're a 550-bed hospital, uh, 75,000 visit ED, tertiary care facility for Suffolk County. If we add up all the cardiac arrests brought into the emergency department, plus all the cardiac arrests. Uh, that occur within the hospital and then take the subset that were V-fib that were resuscitated and unresponsive after resuscitation. We're talking about a total of about eight to ten cases uh, potentially a year. And uh, actually, uh, if you look at the literature in those people, what do they have often? What caused them to arrest in the first place? Ruptured in cranial aneurysm, intracerebral bleed. They had a primary neurologic problem to start with a lot of these times. I, you know, again, I don't mind it because it's, it seems like it's sort of so benign, but it would be nice to know if it actually works because this next gets to the next level, which is public policy, where they're going to say, are you a hypothermia cardiac arrest hospital? We're going to bypass you and drive people and ambulances and everybody to the next guy, and we're going to sell you just like the mask pants we sold to the ambulance companies, and they're going to start this in the field. You know, I yeah, think it's going to be liability issues if you don't do the cooling on someone that you absolutely because the science isn't there yet. Six? Do you want to go to six? Oh, I got to tell a quick anecdote, real quick. I had a guy last um, last winter came in with this exact scenario, and I was at a hospital I hadn't worked at in a while for our group, and the hospital was not equipped to do this. He was a perfect candidate, so I asked him to cool his IV fluids and get a bunch of ice. Had the wife in the room for the resuscitation, explained to her to you know kind of hope for the best, but plan for the worst. I don't know how well he's gonna do. And I explained this whole process while we're packing him in ice. And as uh, two of the nurses put this big ice pack right in his groin, she turned to me and said, aren't you gonna freeze his balls off? <laughs> That's exactly what she said. He had a great outcome, got three lesions stented, went home less than a week later, but. Um, but no balls. No yeah. balls. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Can't, can't, can't have everything, you know. How do you do it? Well, if you read one study, you don't even have to do it. But uh, people pack them in ice. They put ice packs on their groin and around their head. So I think the real scientific question, because people are trying to sell cooling helmets now. You put the helmet on and the brain goes cold. Is it really a brain phenomenon, or are you stopping evil humors becoming released in the rest of the body that are secondarily affecting the brain? That, it, there's actually some science to both of those things. It'd be nice to know what it is. So you didn't actually need to cool down the whole body, or do you just need to cool the head, or is, you know, which is the one that works? But it's, it's cold. It's cold sailing. Cooling blankets that you would use, like they'd use in the operating room for for hyperther hyperthermic patients. Uh, uh, ice packs in the uh, in the groin. Well, what about a body bag? You put them in a body bag. That was my suggestion last year. You put them in a body bag and fill up that bag with ice kind of thing, like you've got beers at the party kind of thing. Put that thing, you cup a hole at the end of the body bag so that the water, which is going to you know, come out, will go into a bucket that's underneath. That's why you've contained the ice. Because once you put it in the gurney and you don't have anything to contain it, it's going on the floor, the nurse is going to fall, break her neck, get an industrial accident kind of thing. It's going to be a lawsuit kind of thing. If, and if so, they don't make it, you're already started with the Just zip it up, done, I'm the, through, you know. You know, actually, in the European study, what they did is they just put fans on them and, and, and external cooling with that kind of stuff. They didn't do any of this fancy stuff. All right, six. This actually, I think, will be something for you to think about. This is asked the question, which has been asked in several papers. Uh, if you have no history of hypertension and you come to the emergency department, you sprain your ankle, broken your wrist, whatever else, and your blood pressure is high, do you have hypertension? 
And the answer, which is consistently shown through the literature, is often you do. Uh, and it, and in, this, in this particular paper, about half of them in follow-up had uh, hypertension. Now, there's, there's sort of an interesting uh, question about this. Everybody in the room, I'm sure, is familiar with white coat hypertension, which means when you're at the doctor's office, you have high blood pressure, but when you're at home, you don't. Here's the problem with that concept. What is the definition of hypertension? It's, it's from a huge study that was done out of the VA, which asked the following question. For a given blood pressure that we measure in the physician's office, at what point do men and women start to increase their chance of having strokes and heart attacks? And it was that number that was defined as this, is, this blood pressure is harmful to you. So in that initial study, it was 140 over 90 in men and 150 over 95 in women. We've forgotten that last part, and it's just 140 over 90 for everyone. So no one ever showed in that, from that sort of epidemiologic study, no one ever looked at what their blood pressure was at home. So I assume if you had white coat hypertension then, you had white coat hypertension now, no one knows whether 130 over 80 at home might not be abnormal. We did a, a study at Stony Brook, which was as follows. It was a chart extraction. We looked at things that were discovered about the patient, that they had high blood pressure, they had a high creatinine or a high glucose or, or, or a, a urine abnormality or whatever. Then we looked at the chart and asked, is there a history of it on the chart? Are they on medications that suggest treatment of this entity on the chart? Or is there any evidence that the patient's aware of this abnormality? And so we found for high sugars, for creatinines, for hypertension, and for one other thing, I forget what it is, we told the patient 15% of the time. Uh, uh, so 85% of the time they left without knowledge that their sugar was high, their creatinine was abnormal, or they had a high blood pressure. There was a rather famous suit that happened on Long Island of a patient who had gone to the emergency department for an orthopedic injury, had high blood pressure on the emergency department chart, 15 years later has a stroke, and it was his next visit to a physician was when he had his stroke, when he came to the emergency department. Uh, when, they dis when they pulled the old records and discovered that he had hyper hypertension before uh, and he was never told, they sued, blaming the emergency department for, for not telling him that he had hypertension. Of course, they won the suit because it's New York and that's what's supposed to happen there. But we do collect a lot of information on patients and often forget that, that w the service is for them, not for us, and that it's important to let them know these abnormalities so that they can get them followed up when they leave. Well, in the States, it's the tradition that every soul who comes into the emergency department will have their vital signs taken no matter what's wrong with you. And if, you, uh, and if it has nothing to do with the reason that you're there, you've got a cut in your leg kind of thing to measure your blood pressure. And then it, it implies some kind of obligation to tell you if it's outside the range of normal, which is very clearly 140 over 90, and say, listen, it's high now. We can repeat it. It's still high. You've got to go to a doctor and get a check kind of thing. That's what's kind of expected if you do this test, which appears to be a screening test, because it's got nothing to do with the vast majority of the reason people are in the emergency department. Uh, Seven. Go ahead. I think a couple things you can do. The first thing is never list a diagnosis on your chart. I know that sounds crazy. We've gone to um, a system where we don't do that at all. We list a first impression, initial impression, diagnostic impression. Do anything, but don't say the word diagnosis, because what that means to a plaintiff's attorney and to the jury is you've, you've concluded your workup and you have a definitive answer. And most of the time, we don't have a definitive answer. So tell them, this is my initial impression. Now, the specific question regarding this is if you have an abnormal vital sign, you don't necessarily have to treat it, but you have to address it. And you have to put it in your medical record. You have high blood pressure, it needs to be followed up. If you do, I mean, I think this other case is bizarre that was 15 years later, but not, not unusual to see that kind of thing happen. But six months later, something happens, a week later, and there's an abnormal vital sign that's been unchecked, meaning it's on the chart and you didn't address it and comment about it in your medical record, you are increasing your liability. I actually heard a, a, a great discussion. That, you know, you see a lot of these people who come to the ER, Chief complaint, my blood pressure's high. 
you know, which theoretically ought to be asymptomatic. And you cannot talk them out of taking their every blood pressure and watching the monitor and how come it's not coming down and the discussion about it's a long-term disease, not a short, you know, all that goes over their head. So this one person, I, I think it was actually from one of these courses, recommended what they do is they give them a prescription pad and on the, part of the top part, they say, you know, blood pressure was 160 over 100 today. And then say, have it rechecked within the next two weeks and take this slip to your doctor to see what happens with it. You've covered all the bases of, of uh, they want to do something about it. They know they need to do it. I think the answer to your, the short answer to your question is to say, get it rechecked sometime and document that. That's all you need to do. You know, and this half of them did that. I don't know what happened down the road. Did all these people continue to have it? But it's it's reasonable. Yeah, it's, I, I, instantly, I will. It, I will. Although Kevin is has far more legal knowledge than I do, I will respectfully disagree in the following sense: that refusing to ever put down a diagnosis also opens you up to well. If you didn't know what the hell a diagnosis was, what'd you send a patient home for? Because they could have had all these horrible diseases that you, you now are showing that you don't know what was going on in the chart, so shame on you. Well, you do list, like I said, an impression, but a good example is when someone says they have nonspecific abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Instead of listing abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea, we feel the, the compulsion to come to a conclusion. Um, gastroenteritis. Okay, now you've committed to that diagnosis, and I'm going to guarantee you, if you write gastroenteritis on your chart on a routine basis, one of those charts will revisit you in the near future. I can guarantee that will happen. The other thing is that hypertension is the disease. High blood pressure is not. So you could say your blood pressure is elevated outside the normal range at this time. And I do agree. We, we do it. We have a spot on our chart. Your blood pressure at this time was this. And, you know, check with your doctor kind of thing. Because it could be due to pain, anxiety, or you could have a high blood pressure. The key is resist treating it. And that's a whole different discussion. But don't acutely drop somebody's blood pressure. Yeah. Well, he's basically saying if you put somebody down as a hypertensive as a diagnosis, that that may affect their ability to uh, subsequently get insured. Technically speaking, you as a as in the emergency department can't make that diagnosis because the diagnosis of hypertension requires that it be taken a number of times over a number of occasions. So one reading, you can call it hypertension. You are not technically making the diagnosis. Let's move on to number seven: hands only, compression only CPR. Uh, so this is an opinion piece. American Heart Association looks at this as a public policy issue. They're saying, you know what? It, it, bystander CPR isn't done all the time, and a lot of people are reluctant to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on patients. Good idea, I think. You know, you look, somebody's real sick, they go down. Would you want to do mouth-to-mouth? -mouth if you wash your hands. <laughs> That's right. Or you know something about it and realize you've forgotten how much you're supposed to do that, so you, you're afraid you're going to do it wrong, so their recommendation is bypass all that kind of stuff and just say, just do compression only. It's not too bad. Maybe it's as good as actually ventilating them, and the science of that is sort of as good as most of this resuscitation science is. It's not so bad. So it's a public policy issue. Better to tell people, just compress their chest, call 911, than do nothing. And so that's okay. I think it's a public, uh, how, how not necessarily science gets to be public policy taken into account that people aren't going to do CPR if they think they're going to get a terrible disease from somebody's mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. We've what done three or four papers now that basically compared standard CPR with c pumping only CPR. Outcomes are uh, vir virtually identical. Okay. What does you know that why? say? Because it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, neither one works. That's Absolutely. Right. But, if yeah, they yeah, don't exactly. have an AED, they can't get electricity, and they've got a shockable rhythm, that's the thing that's going to help them. But one of the things I think the Heart Association said is not so fast. Before we abandon breathing and, and, and pumping, too, they said in people who have had CPR courses and feel comfortable doing, in terms of the mechanics of doing breathing and, and pressing, that they ought to continue doing breathing and pressing, and that it's not a, a, a condemnation of that uh, across the board. I, I, I'm not actually that much of a nihilist about CPR, and I think some of the recent uh, uh, data is, is not so bad on it. When, years and years ago when I was in training, we actually expected to resuscitate people from, from codes. And we had sometimes patients that were awake while you're pumping on their chest and it irritated them to no end. Uh, but along, somewhere along the way, and it was, it was uh, CPR when I was a resident was a violent exercise. 
for you and for the patient. You always broke a few ribs doing CPR. But then they started to treat this 50% uh, train in people and 50% down, 50% up. And rather than square wave CPR, it became sine wave CPR, it became Richard Simmons CPR. Let's have a nice, let's have a kumbaya CPR, which didn't do squat. Uh, and so we, that's been that way for about 15 years or so, and no one ever gets resuscitated anymore. Uh, but we're going back to uh, two characteristics of CPR. It's returned to hard and fast, violent CPR, and also continuous CPR. And there's some data coming from some people that's actually very favorable toward it. So we, it, we ha it becomes harder and harder to discount as a, as a uh, useful modality. Anybody have the thumper? When we trained, we had the thumper, the prolonged resuscitation. We hook it up, Maybe. and this... Th this thing would just slam the, flog the heart. I mean, stand back, because parts Absol were flying off yeah. this thing. The, the device was made in Michigan. They sent it around a bunch of our ears, and we tried it. Boy, if you got your hand near that thing, it's gone. you were in trouble. <laughs> this thing was really good. But it only worked with certain types of anatomy. It just, there are certain chest configurations that just would work for squat. Yeah. Well, number anyway. eight's going to change your practice. Absolutely. Number eight, I like this one. Blood, blood patch rates after lumbar puncture with Whitaker versus Quinky needles. The only thing I don't like about it is I don't know why we're using the surrogate marker of, of blood patches. Let me ask you this question. How many patients do you see that return to the ED that have a spinal headache? A fair amount from either our intervention or someone else's. The pain management doc stuck them or the orthopedist stuck them or the radiologist did, neurologist or we did. And how easy is it to get the anesthesiologist in after 5 p.m. to do a blood patch? All of a sudden, caffeine is the wonder drug, right? Did you try pain meds and caffeine? Because if you give it to them for the next eight hours, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll come do the blood patch then. So I think these, based on this study design, we're really underestimating the amount of spinal headaches. They said basically the lumbar puncture, or I'm sorry, uh, blood, blood patch rates um, overall in these patients were um, significant. I think what was the number here? It was 9.9% were performed in a 4.2 if you used a 22 gauge Whitaker needle. 15.2 and 29.5 respectively for a 22 and 20 gauge quinky. A quinky is the cutting needle, the one that's in the kit. Remember, never use the needle that's in the kit. The reason is they expect we're going to throw it away. So they put the most ridiculous piece of junk in there possible because they have to have one in there to call it a spinal kit. You gotta get your better needle. And I'll tell you, there is great data in the OB and anesthesia literature, about 30% reduction in spinal headaches by using the Whitaker needle. Are you guys using atraumatic Whitaker needles? Great. And when I first started, I used a 25 gauge. And I tell you, I just, I mean, if you don't have everything just perfect, you bump into anything, it just bends up into a pretzel. But the 22, as they're stating here, gives you enough tensile strength it won't bend, but it also gives you the protection you're looking for. You want you want to comment on any differences in technique and procedure? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. You have a comment first? Yeah. They're hard to use. I try once or twice and then I get better. Let me help you right now. Some people say what the anesthesiologist will do, okay, let's say you put a wheel in the skin and you infiltrate initially with a 25 gauge needle, the little blue one they give you in the kit, then use the 18. Some people say, well, leave the 18 in place and you can just put the 22 or the 25 right through there. That's okay if you know your trajectory is right. You can't redirect with that 18 in there very well. What I would say is, and this is the experience that I've had, right or wrong, this works well for me. Infiltrate with the 25, use the 18 gauge needle to infiltrate further and get them really numb in the trajectory I think will work. That's opened the skin up. Now the skin's open, you don't have to worry about popping through the skin with a non-cutting needle. And it goes right in at that point. You can redirect, it's not a problem. The 25, I, yeah, I, I would go through those like candy, but the 22, unless you really do something significant with it, will not bend, unless you try and go through intact skin with it. Other comments, uh, patients that we see that have negative LP for the horrible headaches are real different ducks than the people that are getting epidural for, uh, for having babies. It's a real different population. I, I think right. that's true. Uh, this study, everybody was done under fluoroscopic control. The thing I, 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 most of the literature supports this kind of stuff. The thing that was funny here is if you do it at L4-5, it's 16%, and if it's L1-2, it's only 5%. Why should that, that be? That's I, because when you swell the conus medullaris, it prevents, prevents more CSF I, leak? i tell you, I mean, I have no data to support this, but I think if you, you palpate anyone, even someone, I'll be gentle here, someone of generous size, when you're in the L4-5 range, I mean, sometimes you can't palpate anything. Keep going up higher, and all of a sudden, you can, you can palpate landmarks. 
That's what I've ended up doing. Sometimes I end up going L2, L3, or L1, L2 to make sure I have good landmarks. So if you're going to have a better success rate, maybe it's better to go higher. That's just my there, thinking there about why. There is something up there, though, called the end of the spinal cord. Yeah, you got to be careful. Yeah. You got to be careful. And don't forget in peds, that spinal cord stays intact further down. So you definitely don't want to go higher in peds, lower. Well, let's do a paper there. How many of you routinely will use one of these pencil-type needles to do a, a lumbar puncture? So it's still the, 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 the substantial minority. Uh, one of my friends had a, uh, an ENT doc, had his daughter come in with a really nasty kind of virally headache. It was a fluey kind of thing. Does she have meningitis? So it wasn't any uh, question about whether she had a bleed or not kind of thing. And we did our, you know, one of our docs did a lumbar puncture on her, and it was clean as a whistle kind of thing. I never heard the end of the fact that uh, she had a headache that was like nobody's business, and we had to get the blood patch and those kinds of things. And it's, this literature, if you read it, is compelling. The difference in the I incidence of headaches is from 30% down to like 5% or 6% with these different needles. How many of you work in places where only the neurologists get to have them because they're more expensive? Anybody? No? Okay. And we've run How into that before. How many here routinely do procedural sedation for lumbar puncture? Interesting. How many would want a lumbar puncture without procedural well, sedation? Well, let's define procedural sedation. Well, I mean, you, can, you can give Versetta as an anxiolytic, and that's not technically procedural sedation. I, I, I wouldn't I think about knocking them out completely. That. I mean, something for pain and something for anxiety. Now, here, here's the science medical question I have. I, I can give you, for your LP, I can give you a dose of a sedative as an anxiolytic, and it's fine. But if I give you the exact same dose, but my intent is to sedate you, then it's not safe to do unless I have a team of six other healthcare professionals to be there standing by to make sure you don't have a cardiac arrest. Did, yeah. I, I want an explanation of this. Yes. So uh, I heard your talk on, do you need to do a timeout before lumbar puncture? Because to me, there's only one spine, and most people, you're not like usually gonna do it on the wrong patient. Oh, I'm sorry, you came in with a sprained ankle and we're about to do a lumbar puncture on you. You know, the Australians and Canadians are just laughing, laughing, laughing about us. Because we have this thing called uh, the Joint Commission, our creditor in the state says that you have to do a timeout to make sure it's the right procedure on the right person and you're not taking off the wrong leg or suturing up the wrong laceration or reducing the wrong sh sh shoulder. And some of the hospitals are really taking it to the point of absurdity where they, they, you stop everything, you step back, is this the right patient, is this the right extremity, is this the right laceration? How many lacerations are there? Oh, I'm suturing up the wrong one, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it is so embarrassing. It's, it's become a joke in our ER. I mean, yeah. it's sort of the wink, wink, nod, nod. They realize it's a paper process and you just got to do it. A couple no. other comments about spinal headache. If you want to know, we, I've got about 1.8 million patient visits. And two years ago, I retrospectively reviewed a huge number of returned um, patients' visits for spinal headache. And you would be surprised what I found. Um, the number one issues were atraumatic needles were not being used routinely. We've changed that at this point. Also, you'd be surprised at what the docs were using. There were several. I think it was 3.5% uh, were using 18-gauge needles. That means you have to throw away the one that's in the kit and go find the harpoon to use. On a Dremel. <laughs> you have to use that. Um, sedation or anxiolysis or me pain meds weren't utilized. Positioning was an issue. Um, but those were the things that really contributed to people not having good technique and, and producing spinal headaches. How many can do it under fluoro in their ER? I'll tell you, I think, and I've, I've done a million spinal taps in my life, when I know it's going to be a problem, I'm not too proud. Crank up the fluoro machine, just get the needle in and go, with, yeah. Ultrasound? Heard, yeah, ultrasound. Or, the trouble is you, you can't still with that tell when you're, you're in the spinal canal no. like you can. You just tell where there's an inner space. Yeah, yeah. And number nine says, uh, you, if you put 10 mLs of lidocaine into a liter of saline, that the Morgan lens irrigation of that eye will be uh, less painful. Anybody doing this? 10, uh, oh, the two of you together must be the same hospital, yes, or the same bill. Uh, and um, they say that irrigating the eye with normal saline is, uh, is um, irrigating is irritating. We do that even though we know that, of course, the abrasion will never heal for the rest of the person's life. Has anybody here ever used any long-acting local anesthetics in the eye? Seems to me there's no reason they shouldn't work, but everybody is scared to death to do anything like that. We're giving you that bottle of Give, uh, oh, yeah. tetracaine. Uh, I'll take it. Yeah, take it. Oh, wait, one we, hospital I worked in, inner-city ER, you had to take that bottle with you in your lab coat. 
because you knew it would be gone. You know, if you run out of Morgan lenses too, or you don't want to spend the money to use them, if you just use a nasal cannula, put it across their, um, the bridge of their nose, you can hook up IV tubing right to it, and it does the same thing. But when you poke them in the eye with that plastic tubing, doesn't it no, hurt? No, it sits right there. It does not go into the eye. It doesn't go into the eye. But it directs the, it directs the fluid right into the eye, and it, it accomplishes the same thing. Ten. Ten. Uh, uh, Alfuses and stone expulsion therapy. This is uh, uh, the whole uh, literature on alpha blockers and kidney stones. Uh, how many people routinely prescribing uh, this for, or some, some congener of this for kidney stones when people leave? Uh, how many of you are, if I come into your emergency department with a, a excruciating flank pain and it's clearly a kidney stone, how many of you will order to give me a liter or two bolus of fluid? Anybody here? How many uh, will you, restrict you, fluids? You set that up like you, you Anybody like restrict fluids? So we got a couple of restrict fluids. As far as I, the only paper I've ever seen on this is in emergency medicine abstracts, which is why everybody should why everyone should subscribe to emergency medicine abstracts. Uh, but what it was a, uh, actually a prospective study, and all of you over here with kidney stones were told to drink plenty of fluids, and all of you over here with kidney stones were told to not drink anything at all, to dehydrate yourself as much as you can. This group over here passed the stone much faster than this group. This group over here had far less pain. And uh, uh, from animal studies, what is known is that if you obstruct one ureter and give the animal a lot of fluids, they pee out the other kidney. Uh, it also increases, when you give a lot of fluids, it will increase the intraureteral ureteral pressure, which will cause more pain. So uh, uh, what happens in a lot of emergency departments is really highly irrational. There's no, there's no basis for what we do. Uh, but you get highly criticized for, for not doing now every, it. It's like washing down your driveway with the hose. It's, you know, flush that stone out of there. You know, you hose down the driveway, you got that, that cleans it out. It's the same thing. It's ho hosing down your driveway with your kidney. All right. So Eleven. those of you with crowded emergency departments, if you look out in the waiting room and somebody's writhing in pain and they're throwing up, think to yourself, Ah, they're dehydrating themselves. I'm really helping them to get better quicker by not bringing them in to be seen. 11, gender disparity and analgesic treatment of emergency department patients with acute abdominal pain. This is sort of, sort of yet another study, a uh, different, different set of population, that says, does one group get less analgesia than another group? And the, the groups that they compared were men and women. And the, painful condition was abdominal pain. And what they found was that uh, the men got more drugs, they got more often, and they got more opioid analgesics. And small percentage difference, 67 versus 60. Uh, so it's again, it's, it's this hospital did this, and it's part of a growing literature that says sometimes certain groups don't tend to get Although, as much pain medicine as others. The whole question with all this kind of stuff is, What's the external validity to this? Does this happen in your ER? I think that's, to me, the only take-home message. I, 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 the first question to me is why, and it may be that there's a gender bias, but I can think of, of two other reasons. One is, uh, in, in my emergency department, uh, uh, women with belly pain need special resources, i.e., they need actually a private room that you can put them in and do a complete exam. Men, you just grab them and the, you just poke them in the belly in the hallway and grab their testicles, ask if that hurts, and, and it's fine. But women actually need privacy. So that may explain at least some of the delay if your resources are limited into where you can get, get them in a place where they can be seen. One thing that we found in, in a study that we did on pain management in general, uh, and this was across all races, sexes, colors, creeds, origins, and whatever else, is that uh, uh, patients who got workups got less pain medicines than patients that didn't get workups. The reason was, you're not getting a workup because I know what's going on with you. So the reason you're here is for pain, so I'm gonna treat your pain. But when the physician was focused on what is causing this pain, they forgot to give the pain medicines. So that's another possibility. I still think the most likely is what the theme of the paper is, is that it actually is a gender bias. Well, yeah, but most degree. women know that men are wimps kind of thing. They're whiners and complaining and much more than they would be because they're stoical, more people, and they've delivered babies and those kinds of things. And men, men are babies, you know. 
Every, this, that's what this paper says. All right. <laughs> you got that? Write that down. <laughs> Number 12. Let's move on to 12. Trends in opioid uh, prescribing by race and ethnicity for patients seeking care in uh, U.S. emergency departments. Basically, they looked at pain-related diagnostic codes um, identified for 42% uh, for of ED visits were sampled. From 93 to 2005, um, opioid prescribing pain events went from 23 to 37%. They think the largest increase was in 2001 when there were some pushes from the Joint Commission and the VA as well to make sure the pain was being addressed adequately. But what was interesting, even though opioids are being prescribed more, they didn't see a change in that differential um, with, the, um, with those minorities. They still had lower percentages. Those percentages, 31% for Caucasians, 23% for blacks, 24% Hispanics, 28% for Asians and others. And so it seems that we still have an issue, for whatever reason, with some ethnicity and race bias with treating pain adequately. That means white men are wimps. That's exactly That's what, what means. that means. Well, what was interesting is one of these studies showed that um, that was regardless of the race and ethnicity of the doctor. Well, you know what, I, I don't think that we should uh, have any prejudices based on race, color, creed, sex, sex, and origin. So I think we should just say that white American men are wimps. You know, that, the, the first study on this was done at UCLA where this Dr. Knox Todd basically looked at the uh, treatment of Hispanics versus non-Hispanics with regarding the long bone fractures, found that the Hispanics got much less analgesics and narcotics than did, than did the, uh, the Anglo um, of long bone fracture patients. And the point that Peter brought out was very true. I mean, they looked at Hispanic doctors under-medicating Hispanic patients. It got, had nothing to do with the ethnicity of the doctor. Then he went to Emory in, in, in um, wherever that is, Atlanta, did the same identical study where those blacks and whites found out that the blacks were getting much less pain medication. Didn't matter what kind of the doctor was either. So he's kind of gone around suggesting that this is a a recurring phenomenon that we need to kind of be more sensitive to. Speaking of pain management, I heard this about this from Jim Ducharme, and I've tried it a number of times since and think it's actually very, it works quite well. Uh, uh, any of you use, uh, ever use, try low dose ketamine uh, for pain management? Actually, we have an abstract coming up this month on low dose ketamine. Um, uh, for uh, Comments? It, I, I first started using it on people that came in with, with tru, you know, truly painful injuries who had a history of narcotic addiction, who, who begged to not be given narcotics because they, they didn't want to uh, deal with it. And uh, ketamine was actually quite uh, effective with them. And it, the dose for my is 0.1 milligrams per kilo IV. Does anybody remember the dose? I think, I think it's 0.1, slow IV. Uh, that's one part I didn't read in the slide from Jim Ducharme uh, when I first started doing this. So I, the first person I gave it to, about five minutes later, I started hearing, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. She was just going nuts. But uh, 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 so well, give it very the worms slow. on the wall that were coming out yes. together. So what it, what painful conditions slowly. have you used it for? Have you used it for headaches? Uh, this is renal colic. Renal colic. Interesting. I've used it for uh, low back pain. When I've used the f uh, all the rest of the armamentarium, and they're really getting starting to get narcotized, and, and I don't feel like I can push, push I don't then have any other good tricks. I make the them ketamine, hallucinate. That's ketamine it. is is a great uh, addition to it. So it's a nice little trick to take away. Well, let's stop here.